if my dog starts barking, I'll I'll mute myself. I got I got a wild dog. Yeah, mine mine's gonna has been in and out of the room, so you might see him through the uh, the virtual background a couple times. Mine hasn't been up to piss on my carpet for a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Comic-Con at home. Uh, my name is Johnny Kolosinski. This is Making a Living Being Creative, where we're going to talk about how you make a living being creative. A uh, uh, little bit about me. I'm a podcaster uh, with 10 years of experience in live arts and arts administration. You can find my podcast where I talk to doctors about what Hollywood gets right and wrong about medicine at HiEverybodyMD.com. Uh, with me today are uh, Lucasfilm licensed artist, Twitch streamer, and creator of Kindergoth, Lee Cozy. Hi. Uh, a screenwriter, uh, Dan Hadgeman, who's uh, responsible for things like uh, Lego Ninjago, uh, 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 Guillermo del Toro's Troll Hunters, uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, and the upcoming Star Trek Prodigy. Hello, everyone. And actor John Noble, who uh, many of you know from things like Fringe and Lord of the Rings. Good day. How are you, Mike? <laughs> Doing really well. Uh, thank yeah. you, everybody, for being here. Thanks, everyone who's watching at home. Hopefully, we'll be able to do something like this in person again really soon. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to kind of get the conversation started uh, by talking about uh, what it is that, that got you into working in the arts. Uh, and uh, working in a creative field. This is kind of an interesting panel compared to some of the other ones that we've done because uh, none of, uh, well, all of you are experts in your field. Uh, none of you formally, formally studied it in, in college and things like that. Um, so let's start with Lee. What was it that led you to decide, okay, I want to, this is how I'm gonna make my living is as, as a visual artist. Um. It kind of just came down to uh, uh, my family moved around a lot. I think we did something uh, like I had 14 schools in 12 years. So uh, my family didn't really have a lot of money. So we were kind of dirt on, you know, on the dirt poor side for a bit. And we just moved around. So every six months when the rent raised, we moved. I didn't have friends. I didn't actually make any kind of major social connections uh, in school. And so my personal release or way I dealt with a lot of the anxieties and stuff with coming to not learning how to interact with people properly was actually just sketching and drawing on anything I could find. And over time, when, uh, you know, as time went on, I just fell in love with cartoons and stuff like that. I wanted to be, I decided, you know, I fell in love with cartoons and I fell in love with comic books and I fell in love with paintings. And I realized I didn't want to be an animator. I wanted to be a storyteller. And so then I started studying just all aspects of that. And, you know, I, my mom and my art teacher uh, were the two people who I asked, what can, you know, what can I do with this? And they said, whatever you want. And I believed them instead of the people who were like, you'll never make money doing this. And just kind of fell into it. Just kept doing it until people were like, that's kind of cool. You <laughs> want to do this thing for us? And I said, yes. And it just kind of snowballed from there. Uh John, what about you? Is there a specific time where you realize, hey, this this is how and why I'm going to make my living as an actor? There was, there was a specific moment. Uh, my background is such that it was the last thing on uh, anyone's mind to do this job or that you could do it. You know, so we went off and did straight to degrees and so forth and got jobs. But I was doing a, I was doing a, an elect a elective which involved a little pr production of Lysistrat. And uh, and I was playing a good role, and I was doing. I think I love this. I love this, and I realised perhaps not that moment, but that that was the first time I can remember really loving what I was doing and knowing that I was really good at it. Bingo! It was like the perfect <laughs> combination. Uh, but I was twenty five before that happened. Uh, but there was a lot of clowning around before then and impersonations. But no, <laughs> that was it. So from then on, it was, let's go and do this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dan, what about you? Is there a specific moment or uh, realization point? Yeah, I don't think, it, I never sought out to be a writer, but I was always artistic, whether it was like drawing or even for a small stint, claymation. I loved claymation as a, a child, music. And, but it, like my plan out of college was to go into advertising because I thought that was the way to make money and be creative. 
felt like that was the good yin and the yang. And so writing scripts was just a, a situation where I live with my brother and we just started writing scripts um, because we love movies. We've always grown up loving movies. And we kind of, uh, as we were dabbling with scripts, we, we got some nice praise early on and we were like, holy crap, this could actually be something. And then lo and behold, it, it turned out to be a career. And uh, it, it, we, I've been writing ever since. And uh, we, we've talked a little bit before uh, about this, um, but you didn't originally intend to focus on animation. Yeah, I mean, when, when we first started out, uh, we always had big ambitions to do a lot of big Amblin, Spielberg-esque, Chris Columbus-esque movies. I remember when we first came out, um, this was in the early 2000s. Everybody, uh, most early writers around our peers were trying to be Quentin Tarantino and throwing in violence. And we, we, we love that wish fulfillment and that wonder. And um, we kind of started creating a name for ourselves of, what, of, of being able to write to both young and old in one script. And it wasn't until the writer strike hit where after the writer strike, it was kind of tough getting jobs that kind of took away all of our, any, any gains we had made before that were all wiped clean. And um, they approached us for a movie called Hotel Transylvania and at first we weren't really interested because we never really thought about doing animation. Um, but then when we wanted to animate, we, you know, if we were like, if we're gonna do it, let's, let's put our hearts into it. And, um, and so, yeah, that led to the Lego movie and that, and that led to Ninjago. Um, sort of a, I, I, I wouldn't say elevated, but like so, something that can uh, uh, have an adult audience as well as a youthful audience. Mm -hmm. Um, and let's let's talk a little bit about still still sticking earlier in your careers, um, skill development uh, without because it, like like we we discussed, and nobody went to school specifically for this here on the panel. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as building your your toolkit as an art as a young artist, mm -hmm. what what did you rely on and how do you build those skills? John, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Uh, I was and still am like a sponge and I watched what was going on and I was able to discern usually if it was good or if it was bad and uh, what, what the BS was involved in it. And I watched and watched and watched and learned and then put into practice because working in theatre in those early days, you could do that. I played multiple roles in multiple shows. Mm -hmm. I had plenty, plenty of time for school development uh, in there. But I also, I mean, I had my voice trained in that that I took very, very seriously. And subsequently, I've done some other courses, and I've taught a lot of courses too, in different places. Mm -hmm. um, but it was observation, and, and not, not like a charlatan saying, I know how to do this. I mean, I really wanted to know how to do it. I remember this, this is an anecdote I don't think I've ever told before, Johnny, but when I was just starting out in the business and, and started to go to the theatre parties and all that stuff, so, and all the old theatre men were standing around speaking in accents and doing slabs of Shakespeare and oh, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> but then I realised, ah, the trick is that they're, they're all doing their you know, Irish or Scottish accent or something or other. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to do those. But by hell, I made sure I did. And then I made a, a, an absolute study of it to the, extent, to the extent where I was not so much longer after that I was teaching accents. But uh, it, it came out of that chuckle. <laughs> What these real theatre people are doing, and also just the slabs of you know prose they can pull off, no, which means mm -hmm. something to them. But it's like, yes, uh, Lee. What about you? How did how did you really grow your your skills as a visual artist early on? Um, it mostly started out with going through books, uh, archaic technology they used to have back in the day, but um, I would just. You know, I would see artwork in books and be like, oh, how'd they do that? And then I would just try to research. I'd find out what I could about the artist. What mediums did he use? What size was the piece? And if I could, sometimes I'd even talk to the artist. I would try to find them at like a convention or if there was an address in the back of the book or something like that. I would reach out to people and say, you know, this is really cool. How did you do this? And a lot of times they'd call me or they'd send me an email or something back later on. Um and say, oh yeah, it was just kind of, you know, oils did this, da, da, da. check out these books or these techniques. And then I go study that stuff. So it was just constantly 
being curious about how things were done of mm. the stuff that appealed to me. And then it got to a point where I had built a fundamental skill set that was strong enough that uh, it occurred to me one day when somebody came up and said, hey, can you do this? I actually told them no. And then the guy next to me said, yes, you can. You already have these skill sets. All you need to do is figure out a way to do them in a different way. And so then it kind of became, you know, then the next time somebody came up and asked me, you know, uh, uh, I won't say which publisher it was, but a publisher came up and said, hey, can you do body painting? And I was like, okay, I know how to use an airbrush. I know, I know how to illustrate. I can freehand draw. Uh, I understand 3D forms and human anatomy. So I said, yes. Then all I had to do was figure out that instead of using the type of paint I was using in my airbrush, I just had to go use cosmetic grade stuff and then figure out whether the, the safety precautions and stuff for mm -hmm. body painting versus uh, you know, painting on a canvas or something. Because it's essentially just a three-dimensional canvas. So you just take the fundamentals you've already established and apply them. And then later on, somebody said, Hey, can you weather props? It's like, well, I could body paint. So that's kind of the same skill set. So I said, mm -hmm. yes. And so it really does come down to just saying yes, and then fine tuning your skill sets to do that next project. And so it's made me a very diverse artist. Uh, it, it, Dan, what about you as far as building out those skills early on? I mean, early on, we would, we were, we were hungry for scripts. It was, it was hard to find scripts, but not just any script, we'd find the scripts of movies we would love and early drafts. And uh, that was a big game changer because, you know, we would, um, we, you know, we would think of that movie of like the Goonies, right? This is like, in our opinion, a perfect movie. And then we would read an early draft and there's like scenes in it where there's like a gorilla riding a golf cart or like them fighting a uh, squid and making it dance away to a Cindy Lauper song. And we were like, this, there's horrible moments in this script. And, and when we were like, we can write horrible moments, <laughs> but like, you know, it felt like the gods were mortal. And, and that allowed us to give us a little confidence of like, we can try to do that. We can try to write a really bad scene. And that, that, that's <laughs> <true>. <laughs> and it became comedy and the rest yeah. is history. <laughs> um, and when is it that, that you made the decision to, to move to LA? Uh, I moved to LA. Uh, I knew I was going to live with my brother, who's my writing partner. He was three years older. He went to film school and I, I moved down to LA. I got a job in advertising and that's, um, I think it was about year 2000. And um, yeah, that's when, you know, what young 20 year olds do in an apartment. We're like, we, we're not hanging out at the bars. We were hanging out Friday nights, writing a script. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was some of the most fun time of our lives, you know, just sitting there and going, trying to make up a movie in our heads and putting it on the page and, and making it read the way we wanted it to be read. Um, uh, John, you, you, you worked in theater for quite a while before you made the transition to TV mm -hmm. and film. Yes, um, what what kind of inspired that change? Uh, it, it was a, a logical change. Although I started late, I, I really did accelerate very fast in terms of success. I was running a company not that many years later. And I directed on the West End and there were things were looking really, really strong. And I, I think in a sense, I, I, I thought, well, I'll we try something new, film and television. I'd done some. Look, I'd done some. And, uh, and the South Australian Film Corporation used to let me come in on their projects. So I learned about making films. Uh, but that was the reason. And then, of course, to shift to the big smoke, Sydney, where no one knew me because uh, there are no theatre actors down there. And uh, so I had to sort of start at the bottom doing cattle calls and all that sort of stuff. Uh, very, uh, very good for the ego. But I'm glad it happened because it really did ground me against my acceleration up and been so fast. Mm -hmm. Down again. And, uh, and it, it, it broke through. Uh, the, the first international was, was Lord of the Rings. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. no, just huge break, huge break in terms of um, uh, <laughs> sort of being uh, people wanting you here. That's the difference. You know, mm -hmm. Thousands of people want to come here. So that happened, and, and it's been a pretty good run since since that time. Some funny ones, though, speaking back then. I was from once I was my agent at the time, and I don't need just, just here. I, I don't even know if I'd moved here. Anyway, I said, Can you? 
uh, go and do an audition. There's a film being made in, in Prague, and they they need so, they need someone to do a few things who can do the big Russian accent. Can you do that? I said, oh yeah. And I didn't know it, <laughs> but <laughs> but by by applying the principles that I, I apply as a teacher, I was able to go in there and win the role. I actually got another one as a Russian as well. <laughs> um, that's that's accents, you know, and and some of them we think we can take for granted, and we can't. Um, you know, the Irish is one that's screwed up pretty, pretty regularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's so many British ones. Again. Anyway, enough of that. But, uh, <laughs> just a little story. <laughs> I, I do like, I was going to say, I like how there is like, uh, like you were just saying, they're bluffing your way through it. It's, it's uh, that parallel kind of with me and people coming up going, can you do, you know, this? Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. And then you go, you, you already know you're a sponge. You already know what you're, you have faith hmm. in what your base abilities are. So you just go find a new way to apply them and it works. Ah, that's true. So I that's love the, the parallel in what you just described is exactly what I just described oh, I um, love yeah. about the body painting. Does Dan have one as well? It'd be kind of cool to see this. Yeah, thing. no, I remember the panic, like when we got our first job, which was a miracle. And, and the first thought was, Oh God, we got to actually know how to write a script. Even though we had written scripts, I was like, yeah, but this is yeah. like professional. <laughs> So I went out and like bought all these books and I'm reading them and like, you know, every, every time I'm like, we're crossing the threshold, Kevin, we got to write the scene where they're crossing the threshold. And like, I was literally like trying to figure out all the, I was like trying to backwards uh, learn how to be a screenwriter as I was writing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> can you write a play? Well, I know English. Read that book after you without becoming writers, mate. Millions of people read all those books and, you're the one that survived to become a writer. And the I, rest I will of say it was like we, my, my brother and I were very fortunate in our our way to break in. Our very first pitch was to Steven Spielberg, and that was our first job. And so this is why I was very stressed. I was like, "Oh my God, we're writing for Steven Spielberg. I gotta look like I know what I'm doing." Hurry, Kevin. <laughs> That's extraordinary. Uh, yeah, it, it was a it was a good pressure cooker. Yes. Uh, um. Uh, how how do you handle critiques and criticism? That's kind of something, especially as the mm-hmm. internet, you know, the internet culture is there. And if somebody doesn't like something you're doing, they'll probably tell you about it. Especially early on, um, mm-hmm. how did you how did you learn to recognize what's a valid criticism? and and constructive and what is just somebody trying to tear you down let's let's start with lee for this one um like in the beginning i would post stuff up on forums like there used there's an art forum called Sejun that a bunch of professional artists would hang out on and they would upload artwork but amateurs could also upload their stuff there and get opinions and so i was doing that um and i was super enthusiastic about it and uh uh like um uh, there's some amazing, you know, professionals uh, that were actually giving feedback on that. And I was enjoying that, but periodically you'd get this, you know, it's like, you suck. You can't draw, you know, I think I remember one time the guy would actually told me you can't draw knees. You know, it's like, you, you're horrible at drawing knees. You can't do this. They look like they're bent backwards and da, 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 da. And I'm sitting there going through like my Bridgman anatomy books. And I go and I get a burn horror, go with dynamic anatomy books. I'm going through everything going, I, I did. I followed the instructions. I did just like they said, I'm looking at, you know, I'm having my, right. like my girlfriend at the time was like, okay, bend your knee. Okay. Okay. It's sketching it. Okay, it looks fine. Me, what is he me, talking I would about? love it. We can't see you in zoom, but I would love it if you had really weird looking knees. and like <laughs> Giant knobby, like troll shaped knees. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, but that was the thing is I was, I was just like, what is wrong with my knees? And then finally one day, you know, this guy gave, was giving me a panic attack and, uh, and granted, I've also received bad reviews elsewhere from people like, oh, you suck. This is horrible. You know, give up your, don't give up your day job type stuff. But this one guy, because he was specific and I was like, okay, he's got to know what he's talking about. So finally I went to his page and I looked up his profile and then I found his website and I looked him up and I was like, this guy can't even draw. <laughs> like, who is he to tell me I suck when he's like an accountant, you know? And, and so it's like, he doesn't have the, like, it's kind of, I discovered that there are people out there who will, who are more than happy to give you their opinion. But as a creative, you sort of have to decide, is that you, you literally have to decide, does that person's opinion matter? And if somebody who is not somebody I respect 
or if somebody who is not a peer or somebody who's not uh, in that chain of who's going to hire me gives me super hypercritical criticism and stuff like that, then I'm probably just going to be like, you know, no problem. You know, thanks for the feedback, but I'm not going to let it get to me because I did that one time and it hurt me because I was trying to solve a problem that I found out later didn't exist. You know, it's almost like having somebody say you're using too much green and then finding out they're colorblind, you know, or you're not using enough green mm -hmm. or something. And it's, it's so it, it really does, you know, so now it's like, I'll listen to art directors. I listen to peers and I do listen to the audience in general when I'm kind of like, what do you guys think? Cause I want a general mm -hmm. appeal from the audience. Like I love that feedback, but that specific grueling, you're doing art wrong. I'm only going to take that feedback from people who know what they're talking about and just blow everybody else off kind of. <laughs> yeah, I, would say, I would say for criticism, I mean, for as a writer, when you're young, your first instinct is like, when someone says something's wrong, you're like, well, what about the other 10,000 words that I wrote? Like, are those <laughs> right? Like, you, so you're, you're automatically defensive. And I would say like, it's taken me a l many years. My brother would tell me, I probably still haven't learned how to take criticism. But I think the thing that we've, that we've gleaned a little bit is that there's always an itch to scratch. Like, um, you know, we're, we're getting notes from executives and things like that. So out, outside of what Lee's talking about or some outside person critiquing you, yeah, that, that um, ignore those. But like, if there's someone who's trying to help get a project across the line, mm -hmm. you know, don't view them as an enemy, view them as an ally or they're trying to help you make it better. But sometimes mm -hmm. their note, you know, could be a wrong approach or as a writer you're like well that would unhinge everything but what you have to look at is like what's the itch to scratch where are they trying to get at what are, what are they trying mm -hmm. to say they're, they're trying to help you even though you feel like you're being attacked you, as an artist they're trying to help you and so the quicker you can get to figuring out what the what the itch to scratch is the quicker you'll be able to find um, something that that makes it a better product mm -hmm. oh. can i tell you a story of yeah. course, please. <laughs> you know that uh, a lot of us do the cameo uh, appearances and so forth. Do a lot of them, and uh, and it's good fun. And uh, I always try to get done. But on this particular occasion, we were actually Penny and I were in the middle of Australia, and uh, and the internet was out at all the storm. The tavern couldn't couldn't get through, and I'm panicking. About five of them lined up, and now finally, I don't know what time of the morning it was, and I found a light somewhere, and I'm doing this. Uh, thing for this woman it's free <laughs> and she wrote me the most stinging review <laughs> and i don't don't, don't, don't get that really that often so i went back and i looked at it and i said oh yeah i suppose if you're looking at it from a certain point of view that be so i wrote to her and said you know i think you're right and uh, thanks for your so that sort of thing she don't you dare come back to me like that and that was it <laughs> just said yeah you're right mate just no, most of the time you, the, most of the time it's the, the stuff on the stuff on social media is is there's a lot of trolling and, and I don't actually look at it very much. I, I'll, I'll say there's uh, certain things I do look at and, and by choice. But, uh, it, it can hurt even if it's out of you know. I remember one fellow when we first opened Lord of the Rings. He said, "This noble he cannot act." By Doctor hits one or something or other, but in all the good ones, that was his thought. And I thought, well, now it wouldn't worry me. And, Do you uh, ever get that fear of imposter syndrome? Because I know as an artist, oh, I get that. Like, uh, it's like, I'm not good enough to be here. Like, you're surrounded by your idols or people you really respect, and you're like, what the hell am I doing here? Well, when you get as old as me, I hope you've got it because I, I don't feel that now, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And when I'm giving certain mm -hmm. lectures, talk about the imposter syndrome. It's very powerful and it exists in all of us. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, really. So, uh, it's just one of those things we deal with. It's, uh, it's probably a good balancing thing, really. Just this, mm, yes, yes. Keep yourself up to scratch here. Make sure your skills are up to scratch, and you can never, you can never back off for a minute. As, mm -hmm. in the, you, know, you can't back off. You just can't. It's got to be full bore. So I feel like the imposter syndrome for a writer is through the writing process. It's not like when you're done with it. It's like you're, you're beating yourself up over every word. So when you finally get done and someone critiques you, you're just like, ah, like I've already been hard on myself. Like, no, this is the way this is like, so if oh. anything, I'm almost too locked in on feeling like this is good. Although that's another danger, but it's like, I don't have the, I can't, 
I'm too biased. I'm like, I need mm. to mm-hmm. sometimes you get your heads too much into the work and you feel like you have blinders on. And, yeah. and that's, yeah. just, that's it's just as dangerous, you know, where you, oh, you try to help you and you don't accept the help because you feel like they're an idiot and you're like, no, well, you know, you're the idiot. Yeah. Um, it can cripple you. But the thing is, can can cripple you. The imposter. Mm-hmm. Any of these things, or fear of criticism, they can cripple you. And they have stopped many people. Just can't do it. Can't stand mm-hmm. the criticism. But we've had to learn to put it in its place. And what you're suggesting is you look for the positive in it and say, "Why?" And sometimes there is some. And the rest of it, you know, I've got to the stage now. That piece of advice about standing up stage left really doesn't not necessary anymore. I don't say that. But, uh, yeah, but there is sometimes there's some terrific stuff, and uh, just if it, you can always sense the spirit in which it's written or said to, you know, that it's not done just put you down. Uh, it's it's there as a considered opinion, and then you take it very seriously. If it's just a flat about the whole thing, this is crap. Or what, that doesn't mean so much. Mm-hmm. Um, Dan, you so your nature of work is like by definition because you're working with your brother, it's collaborative. Um, <laughs> obviously what you're looking for in a collaborator from your brother is, is this guy, my brother, but in general, um, what is it that you're looking for in someone that you want to work with either in the writing room or somebody that you want to work with, you know, as a, uh, as a producer or director or something like that, what are you looking for in collaborators? Mm, There's, I mean, there's so many different types of collaborators, like in the writer's room, a diverse voice, like someone who's able to, I don't want a clone. I want someone to bring in new ideas because it's like, that's where magic happens. And when you think you know something and someone says, well, what if this happens? You're like, ooh, that's interesting. Because I always feel like the, the secret sauce in screenwriting is surprise. You know, it's turning a page and going, ooh, this is interesting. I, this is a betrayal. This I never saw this coming. And so that's what collaboration is great for is to get you out of that, a different perspective. Um, in terms of my brother, I think we have similar tastes. So we need we need to be able to call each other out where we go, I know you want this scene to be this way, but it's not coming across this way. Because oftentimes you're like, no, 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 you're reading it. It's in your head. This is the way it is. And you're like, dude, I'm reading it and it reads flat. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need people to call you out on your bullshit, so to speak. Um, mm-hmm. So that's 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 an important in a collaborator. And, 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 and it's, it should be a voice that you respect, a voice that you feel like they do good work and you know it's coming from a place of, um, um, of trying to make the project better. And, uh, and with great collaboration, the project always is better. Uh, John, is there something that you look for either in actors that you're working with or if you're working with a director um, uh, that you yeah. really appreciate or really like to see? You know, it's it's this is the cliche, Johnny. But uh, you can walk. I can walk onto a set, and I'll find an actor that is truthful. There's that cliche right there. That is truthful. That is truthfully there to do what uh, she or he is there to do. Who is collaborative in the sense that to do it together makes sense. And uh, that form of collaboration is priceless to me. You know, and working with good actors. I went onto the set of the Good Doctor, and uh, a lady that was a lead in that. Um, oh, Marvelous, wonderful actress. Anyway, the good doctor show. She just accepted me with open arms. We just talked straight away, collaborated, and then we created something which is really good. Uh, that, I, but you know what? Actors hate being told what to do by other actors, and that's you know giving someone a reading or something is deadly. Mm-hmm. Uh, they won't listen to you. But they'll also resent you. So you've got to find ways, even as a director. Uh, you find ways of turning around the other way rather than saying that's crap. You'll find a way that that could have worked, whatever it would be. You know, people don't like that sort of thing. They like to be involved. They like to think it's it's a, a talk between the two of you. It's not just you. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, it. Lee, I mean, a lot of your your work tends to be more solo, but but you also you know, depending if you're working on a contract or if you're working on something like a comic book or something like that, that point in time, you do have folks that that you're working alongside. How does your workflow change with, when you get um, somebody else there? It, it pretty much always depends on every project. So I kind of grew up in like my professional careers, 
has been moving in and out. I've got, obviously I do the Lucasfilm Disney stuff is one of my biggest clients and, uh, and other ones as well, but it's, it's, I've kind of bounced around a lot with, uh, like startups. So, uh, with a lot of like small startup Mm -hmm. projects and companies and things, and whether they're publishers or technological or whatever, they were all pretty much every, almost every professional company I've worked with other than really big fortune five companies have been startups. Um, I don't really have a middle ground. So in those startup environments, everybody has to wear different hats and everybody has to be able to switch roles on the fly and pivot on the fly, depending on the needs of the project and what your, what the ultimate goal is. So in the case of Speed Racer, um, I was the creative director. And so I put together this team with um, Robbie Musso and uh, Tommy Yoon and, uh, and James Rochelle. And that was probably my favorite project I've ever worked on in a collaborative environment. Mostly for me, it was working with Tommy. Um, and that was because the way he and I worked is Tommy wrote Speed Racer, but he was also an artist for Speed Racer like 10 years before. So when I was doing art for Speed Racer, we would switch roles. I would have him art direct me mm-hmm. and then, or a creative direct me. And then while uh, he was doing his stuff, I was his creative director. And so, but we could just pivot back and forth, like in the same conversation, uh, kind of like, cause you always have that kind of like the, the chain of command thing, but it would literally just flip on the fly based on what the goal of what we were trying to achieve at that moment was. And I love working with people where you can do that, where there's no ego involved. There's nothing. It's just, how do we put the best product forward? How do we entertain the most number of people? How do we make the fans happy? And can we put out something that just blows their mind and is really cool? Mm -hmm. And that's the goal. That's the target. We're not here to make one person look better than the other or, you know, or outshine somebody. We just want to put together the single best project we can. And mm-hmm. so, you know, that, that kind of in-depth collaboration, I really love. And unfortunately working solo as a freelancer, like I do, I don't get it often. So the few times I get it, I'm just, you know, it's like a, it's like a really fine dish. You just, you don't want to work <laughs> really fast. You kind of want to just, oh, we, we finished the project. Is there something else we can do? That was so much fun. I just, mm-hmm. I want to savor more. So. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, as as your careers have progressed, you know, early on, you're probably going to want to say yes to to most of the offers that come to you. But as you get a little bit farther in your career, there's going to be things you want to turn down. Um, how do you recognize, A, what's worth saying no to? And um, how do you address that? Um, John, do you want to start with that? Absolutely. Uh, one thing I've noticed about myself is that uh, if I have a, a, a gut feeling against something, but I allow myself to be convinced to do it for pragmatic reasons, and this has happened several times, that every time has been bad. Every time has been bad, whether it's, uh, it's casting a certain person or, or uh, quite often is that, you know, it's the decision to, or will you direct this play? <laughs> yeah, I will. No, it, it's a rotten play. You knew it was a rotten play. So it's uh, that voice is <laughs> that voice is pretty powerful in me, and it'll tell me, and it has on shows um, that <laughs> just, just would you go and see it, mate? No, I wouldn't. No, I didn't want to do it. But as a youngster, and you, this is what you made when you're coming out. You, anything that comes along is this gold. We used to love getting commercials in those days, where I came from. Because it'd be this slab of money when there's nothing else. It's great. <laughs> and then people, <laughs> then, then people are recognised the merch from the commercials. <laughs> that's so weird. Yeah. That's all. I love the analogy, just slab of money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, slab. Uh, Build a house uh, right there on that slab. Yeah. I think I, I think for like like we will we actually like We've been lucky to say no to a lot of stuff, but I think we've said no to everything that we were working on. Like, I can't think of anything <laughs> in Star Trek. We've always, there's always been some moment <laughs> where even for like the like Lego movie, I remember like Dan Lin said, I've got three projects, I potentially um, it was like Lego movie, Tom and Jerry and Flash Gordon. We're like, oh, Flash Gordon, you know? So it's like, again, <laughs> then we were saying no to that. 
for Star Trek. We felt like, oh my gosh, this is like, wow, that's a that's a big one. I don't know, like, like I don't think we can, do, we, I don't think we can do it. But there's always a moment when you're after you've told yourself no, you're like, but wait a minute, what if we do this? And like when I talk to my brother and I have those conversations we start like the wheels start spinning. You're like, oh yeah, it'd be really cool if you did this with the Lego movie or it'd be really cool if you did this with Star Trek. And then you get excited. And when you get excited, you're pregnant. And you're like, I got I, I to gotta do this. So that's usually the process. Leave like the analogy you. of being pregnant because then it's like, and now you got to push it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very apt, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, it, there's kind of two criteria. Early on in my career, uh, the stuff I said no to was pretty much only stuff that compromised me. So if it was a project, I wasn't comfortable with the subject matter or, you know, I was doing, I was doing pinup art for uh, several magazines. And one of them sent me a project saying, we want, you know, you to do full nudes or something. And this company also did some fairly explicit stuff. So uh, I talked to my friend, Joel about, you know, what is, where does he kind of draw the line and stuff like this? And he's like, I just told my publisher, I won't draw genitals. And that totally kept him out of any of the more explicit categories. And I was like, you know, that's a good idea. So I did that. And granted, I obviously didn't get as many projects from that client as I would have, but I was very happy that I made that decision because I was, I was happy with the art I put out. Even to this day, I still like the art that I put out at that time because it was, you know, it was, tasteful. I like cheesecakey kind of fun stuff. And it seemed fun and cheesecakey. Um, and, uh, and then the criteria I started putting on stuff after that sort of became, you know, uh, do I have the time and, you know, will it bring me joy? Um, and unfortunately I, I will admit the, the do, do I have the time to do it is sometimes superseded by will it bring me joy? Because mm -hmm. there's been a lot of projects I've said yes to that I didn't have time to work on, but it's like, okay, well, I can stop eating or I can stop sleeping. Yeah. Both of those will have to go. Yes. I'll do the project. <laughs> and, and then I'll go and do the project. And you know, then my wife's like, I haven't seen you in a week and you're an absolute wreck. What the hell's going on? It's like, Oh, I just did a transformers thing, you know, cause I'd never worked on transformers. I took the project. So good example, I guess. <laughs> um, wow. so, so we, we kind of had a, a, a preliminary conversation on this and I'll, tell people where to find it as we wrap things up but one thing we didn't really cover much in that one was networking and we got a lot of questions about that um what has how has what do you think of as networking and and what's its effect really been on your career positive or negative uh dan do you want to start us off on this one yeah i don't think we did any networking early on i mean our networking was trying to write the best goddamn script we could write and get that out but I think like now with Twitter and things like that, like even today, like I was, I love someone's storyboards. I'm like, hey, are you available? You know, there, there's, it's getting your work out there on Twitter. Um, I guess people also Instagram, but I'm not, we're not really on Instagram, but like it's so much wide open. It's so wide open now um, to be, you know, that, that, um, that you can get your works in front of people who are making decisions. You know, it's, it's, I guess that would be the best way to network now. Mm -hmm. uh, John, any thoughts on on networking and and uh, and things like that? I was always told that I was not good at it when I ran the theater <laughs> company. <laughs> when I ran the theater company, the, the board members would say, "John, you go out there and network." And I'd say, "But we're doing well. I don't want to do that." Go and talk. So I wasn't that good at it uh, at that stage. I hadn't found the need to do it in. Um, in, in the States at all, mm -hmm. or, or other ways. So uh, it happens, for, I think it happens, what I've noticed it happens in film and television, it's by word of mouth. So if you, uh, someone's thinking of employing you, they'll make a call, they'll ask someone. I remember J.J. Uh, Abrams' uh, father speaking to me at the opening night of that show, of uh, Fringe, and he said, you, you know J.J. rang me about you. <laughs> really, because he was a producer and I'd done something called the Natalie Wood story with him in uh, Australia. Now, that's bizarre, for us there. but that happens a bit. And also, you know, directors, actors, actors will ring each other too. Mm -hmm. Just see, see what, the, what it's like to work with their, yeah. we do that. If that's networking, there it is. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee? 
Um, networking for me is really like, I, I'm kind of like with John, I'm not good at it. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I like the, the Lucasfilm job came as a direct result of networking, but I didn't do anything. It was literally, I did art. Uh, my first big project was Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. you know, and then uh, the people I worked with on Lord of the Rings all went off on their different things after the third movie. And then I went to go work at DreamWorks on some Shrek licensing stuff. And then somebody's like, oh, somebody, one of the guys from Lord of the Rings went to work at DreamWorks on another project. And they were like, hey, go get this guy, you know, because he also can do the style of art we want. And, you know, just like through these weird networking connections that I had no influence or anything in, I ended up actually working on Indiana Jones, which then led to Star Wars. And I've kind of been there ever since because I'm very happy. Um, and then, uh, but as far as like my professional networking, I really suck at it. Um, I had uh, one of my friends come up to me one time saying, I'm looking for a designer and a really good artist. Do you know any? And I said, uh, I think I know a guy over there. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize he was trying to hire me and I just referred him to somebody mm-hmm. else. And it happened, you know, years later, somebody else came up. It's like, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, it's like, I need an artist to design spaceships. And I was like, oh. Have you seen Jeff Zugale? He does this project called Spaceship a Day. The guy, all he does is spaceships. He's brilliant. And so I would always deflect it to somebody else. And um, and then one time I was just like, I really want to work on Wolverine or do something like this. And one of my friends pointed out, it's like, dude, you're co-writing like independent underground books and stuff with Len Wein. I'm like, yeah, he's great to work with. Like he created Wolverine. Like, why not just ask him? And it never occurred to me to do that. And then of course, unfortunately, uh, Len passed away a few years ago. So when it, when I finally decided I I should have done that, you know, obviously the time had passed. Mm -hmm. And then then it's also like, I was hanging out with Paul Levitz and, you know, uh, you know, Harlan Ellison and all these other legends in the field while I was hanging out with Len. And it never occurred to me once to go, does anybody have a project? Are you looking for an artist or, you know, anything? And, you know, I've really loved to do swamp thing, something. And it never occurred to me to do that until kind of it's too late. So I'm the guy who comes up with the really good punchline 2 a.m. after the bar's closed and you're like, oh, that would have been a good comeback. You know, there's so, like a, a French term for that. That's like the, the realization in the shower or something along those pretty lines. much. And you're like, oh, that would have been brilliant. But that was me oh, when it comes to networking. Like, like, there should be a German word for that. <laughs> <laughs> there should. Like, like standing by the hedge. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's, it's, so I'm not that good at networking and I'm, I, it's only with the pandemic that I've kind of made the concerted effort. I've started writing mm-hmm. things down. I want to do this. I mean, even a good example right here on this panel, which I didn't occur to me until earlier this week. Um, I've, we've talked about it repeatedly and stuff like that, but John and I like created a little cartoon character dude together. Mm-hmm. And I've got like a whole plot line for like a little storybook for a kid thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there like, at what point is it? polite versus you know rude or professional mm-hmm. to actually go and this is the thing i always have anxiety over is would it be out of place to go let's go like, would you be up to finishing this let's let's do this and make a book out of it and get it out there and see if it entertains people and you could do that lee we've got to do that i oh, know it's been 30 years it's been going on <laughs> i'm game <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. So there i've networked for the first time successfully in my professional career and we got it on tape live on camera but yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm horrible at it. I, I accidentally network more than I actually successfully network. I feel like like that's a lot of people who are successful at networking also don't think they're good at it because no, I'm just in it because a lot of it is just being a nice guy and not building a reputation, nice person and not building a reputation as somebody who's a jerk or horrible to work with. Mm-hmm. That's a big, that's a big lesson. I remember like, I think I remember hearing like there was some, I remember it was around seven years of us working as writers and nothing had been made. And I read this statistic that most writers quit after seven years. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. and they, either, they either burn out or they burn all the bridges. It's like one or the other. And I'm like, I'm close to burning a lot of bridges. And so, <laughs> and a lot of it is, is you're right. It's like, half the job is just being a nice person and or or being someone that they want to work with like you may not have all the answers but if they want to work with you 
you know, they'll give you the time to find those mm -hmm. answers, you know, whereas if you're trying to force it and you're going, no, 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 it's like, they're like, I don't want to work with someone difficult. There's not enough time mm -hmm. in this world to work with difficult people. Neil Maybe. Gaiman did a really cool commencement address in like 2011 or 2012, talking about kind of like the, the good, fast, cheap, you know, pick two. Um, if you're, if you do excellent work, uh, if you get turn it in on time or if you're a joy to work with as long as you're two of those things then 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 people will want to work with you uh -huh. like I remember the suffer the toro was like if you're crazy you better be really fucking good like, <laughs> um uh, it, 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 people often talk about people in creative careers not having a real job or not doing serious oh. work um all right, there's my dog. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, about uh, not not doing creative jobs aren't real jobs. Is that something that you've had to encounter? And when did it stop, or did it stop? Uh, it was a pervasive thing. I mean, I was at country in 1950s Australia. You know, no, it was ah, it's a very nice, you know, and they'd be on concerts and stuff and watch the films. But no, it wasn't something that was part of our our life at all. Even though people did it. You know, people still had their, their dance classes and they did it, but it wasn't part of their life. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to take the kids to gym, then I'm going to take them to dance school. and Nothing, nothing like that. Go to football training, son, I'd say. I think it like, I can look back at my parents and like, there was a fear of like, they knew we were, really, we were artistic and we had these ambitions, but they were, they don't want to see us fail, you know? So no. I think it's like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you really sure you want to try to make a living being creative? That seems like a, a road of, of pain. And the thing is, it's like, if you love what you do, you enjoy that road of pain. If you're yeah. like, this is what I like, you know? So, yes. Yeah, I, well, I think it's also with that, if you enjoy what you do, you also, like the whole thing, like if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Um, it holds because I will work sometimes, you know, 16, 20 hours in a day. And I will do this sometimes for a week or two straight and have no regrets. As mm. long as I love the project I'm working on. And usually those projects where that happens, it's usually a personal project or it's a painting or it's something, it's an idea I'm trying to execute and get across on my own. And it's, yeah, it's, I'll do it. And I actually have to have my family periodically go, we miss you. And <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, let's, Let's go watch some episodes of Archer or Robot Chicken or something for dinner. Yeah, I worked, so I remember when I was 18, I worked in a shit factory. I worked at a sewer treatment plant, shoveling rocks to move it from point A to like point B. I'm like, that shit was work. That was work. That was like, you know, <laughs> right. and I remember the, the, the construction guys would be like, stay in school. I'm like, I'm like, I got it. I'm learning. <laughs> uh, it, we're kind of getting to the point where if uh, we were actually, uh, at the convention center, there'd be somebody holding up a sign telling me to wrap things up. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, kind of want to get to our last couple questions here. Um, this is a good one that came in after we had our, our earlier conversation that I really liked. Um, what are some hidden skills that you think make the difference between an average creator and someone who has the potential to, to be at the top of their class or top of their field? Um, are, are there like hidden ninja skills, either creative or not, um, that, that kind of separate the, the wheat from the chaff there? That's tough. Cause I mean, I would think those skills would be different for every person. Like, I think I can, no matter how hard things get, I like to have a sense of humor. And I think that's a big skill of like, you know, when things are getting really tough in the writer's room, it's, and, um, there has to be a sense of joy of saying, yeah, this is a slog, but let's look at the bright side. Let's, we're writing a TV show. Let's, you know, being able to balance yourself. Um, I think that's a big thing. Yeah, I look, I, I, the thing that I perhaps have noticed is that uh, as, as much uh, performing as a teaching is that the one, that person, one that shows incredible concentration and that is prepared to take risks. In other words, just doesn't take the straight line. Gives mm -hmm. you something else to go. And there's a lot of 
plain as any that's about people doing that. That's a thrill, unless it's a stupid, absolute ludicrous, <laughs> puerile thing. But uh, but if it, they try something, it doesn't have to work. It doesn't have to work. It's just I'm thinking as a teacher, obviously, but or working with an actor, and they'll flick you something that you hadn't rehearsed. You go, yeah, thank God. I'll drop a name. I worked with the uh, with uh, Al Pacino two years ago, and he's a, an improviser, Wonderful. and he would he would throw stuff. Yeah. He would throw stuff at me, and I'd go, oh, shit, let's go for this. And we'd, we'd imp- basically improvise the scene. But that's him. Just blah, 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 get, stay on if you want to go to the right. <laughs> I want to change my answer and double what John said. Risk. People who are willing to take risks. You can say work with Al Pacino. <laughs> the, the risk aspect, that's massive. Because I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of writers who are trying to play it safe, who are trying to please others. And if you're willing to please yourself and take risks and – and do something, you know, that's massive. It, it really comes down to an original voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm kind of thinking like, uh, uh, or, you know, it's it's kind of like for me as an artist, I kind of go, like, I sort of want to go back to kind of what John said in the very beginning is be a sponge. Um, mm-hmm. The, like, I know that there, there's some artists out there that I love and adore. And the, at one point they were just cranking out art and they were overwhelmed with all the projects and stuff they had to do. So all they could do was what they know, what there was in their comfort zone. Mm. And it was when I watched that, I realized that, you know, watching their art improve, improve, improve comfort zone. Mm. And suddenly their art stopped improving. They were cranking stuff out left and right, but it just, mm. it wasn't any more stellar than anything else that they had done. And it sort of became I don't want to say blase, but it, it, you know, it just didn't have, it plateaued. It, it wasn't really pushing the envelope like they used to. Then they disappeared for a, a year or two, came back and suddenly their art is just amazing. And it's mind blowingly good again, because they, you know, they, uh, they stopped working on so many projects that they were weighted down and they were able to actually take an amount of time to soak up new influences, to basically study and practice new things. As an artist, I'm constantly, it goes back to the, the very beginning we were talking about opening up a book, talking to another artist. How did you do that? Show me. And then I'll go practice it and I'll keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And then one of these days I will crank out a piece and whatever my brain, you know, whatever stuck when I you know, was working on this technique, whatever got stuck in my brain just came out in that artwork. And so suddenly it's all like, oh, I can see that little bit of influence from my buddy. You know, it's like, that's something he taught me. And, uh, and I think that that's really that, that ninja skill you're talking about is basically be a sponge. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you, if you keep pushing yourself and that also goes to take risks as well, because you have to, essentially it's the equivalent of stepping out of your comfort zone. You have to be uncomfortable and then deal with it and you become better. But if you're always just being comfortable, you'll never get better. And it goes back to like, I swear, the, the, the secret sauce, surprise, like whatever mm-hmm. your craft. I feel like if you can surprise yourself, mm-hmm. you're going to surprise the audience. You're going to. Isn't it is amazing. Yeah, it is true. Yeah. It can, you want people on their heels going, what's going on? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know where we're going. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. That's, that's the bread and butter. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, <laughs> all right. And, uh, it, it, kind of time to wrap things up so one last question um if if you could give one message one career message to yourself uh at at 20 or at the beginning of your career other than you know buy amazon buy apple buy bitcoin (laughs) uh is is there anything in particular that that you would tell yourself uh when you were starting out I mean, I would say something that I've tell, I tell a lot of young writers is that I feel like the ingredients to success are passion and persistence. And it's a long game, you know, and you think you're going to get kicked out and you think you're going to question yourself. But if you just stay at it and you stay on course and you believe in yourself, you have that passion, it's going to crack open. I've gotten a lot of really bad advice over the years. So like part of me almost like I, I'm torn on this question because I almost want to tell myself, you know, if you, if your heart, if you really feel this in your heart, do it. But I've also gotten some great advice over the years that was amazing. And then there was a couple of things where had I actually done it my way or the way I wanted to, or accepted the contract or the project I wanted to, my career would have advanced tenfold kind of Mm -hmm. stuff. So um, 
so I'm sort of torn on that because it's, it's, you know, I almost want to say, you know, uh, choose your friends wisely <laughs> and, and who, you know, and, and, or even better yet, vet the people you're taking advice from better. Mm-hmm. Uh, Can those people draw knees? Yeah. Well, hmm. I'm not even thinking that I'm thinking like I had, we, we talked conversation previous about agents and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I had an agency come up to me and I had never spoken to an agency. I wasn't looking for an agent. There was nothing there, but I had a comic book that was successful and they came up and said, we would like to represent you. I went to somebody I was told by somebody else, you really should respect this person's opinion. And that person said, no, our company will represent you. You'll be fine. And then that company folded and the other company was like William Morris agency. And I didn't know that that's like the cream of the crop. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I should have just said, nah, I'm going to, I should have done my research and, and checked rather than just taking somebody's blind opinion mm-hmm. uh, or not blind opinion, but you know, it was a business decision on the part of that company, but right. You know, I should have said no to him. Yes to them. And, you know, because agencies don't generally just come up and offer you an opportunity like that. Yeah. And I did not know that at the time I thought because I had three or four agencies just throwing business cards and let's meet, let's have coffee. Let's do this. Let's go out for lobster. And I just thought that's how it happened, mm-hmm. you know, because it was happening so often. And then I discovered, no, that was just, it was a, it was a moment in time. And I let it go by because I was naive about it. And I trusted somebody that I was told I should trust. And then when I did background later, I realized, Oh, maybe yeah. I shouldn't have trusted that person actually. Uh, John, anything you would tell to 20 year old John Noble? Well, to, uh, um, sad to admit, 20 year old John Noble didn't have a clue about <laughs> creative life and uh, and uh, I didn't for a number of years to come. I don't know, mate. I, I just, it just took me. Mm-hmm. Sounds, I mean, the whole thing, my whole life, my career has taken me, and I don't know how much say I've had in that. I'm not being woo woo there. It's just, you know. Um, mm-hmm taking certain uh, bends in, in the road and and then aggressively as soon as they're there I attack them I don't sit back and wait but I was <laughs> I was so interested in the early statements here where, where people were talking about what they thought they could do when they were teenagers with their creative ability and I thought oh god do people really still think about that when they're teenagers you know I had no idea of, of what they're talking about so it's been amazing sharing the panel with, with these two uh, wonderful fellows uh, it's. I, I don't mean to denigrate it or lay back and say it was easy. It was not easy. The thing that, Dan, and I think Dan might have said this, the thing that's important is to have passion. I had it. To have persistence. I had it. And I've still got both of those. Mm-hmm. The, the, this, this is what this industry does to me. That's a good thing. So, no, I couldn't have got the advice <laughs> except for that. <laughs> How to bowl a better in swinger if you're a cricketer, you know what I mean? That's what I did. And uh, no, it's been after that, really, I, there was no one to advise too much. Uh, it was just sort of like, jump. I do now, I have a great relationship with my manager. But no, just <laughs> applying it and uh, trusting and taking the risks, as we spoke earlier about. That's it. <laughs> All right. I think also, kind of what John was just saying with uh, he, you know, it, he, he, want, he can't say it wasn't hard work because it was, but that uh, something that I like to reiterate when I talk to people and it goes to kind of the whole, almost like encompasses the entire conversation tonight that Dan and everybody else has mentioned, that if you love what you're doing, it doesn't seem like work. It doesn't seem like it was as hard. But then when you look back and realize you were grinding and just like running as fast as you could, as hard as you could, as long as you could. And it just kind of, you know, something magical happened and it came together. And mm. it's, you know, you don't realize until you've suddenly gone, wow, I can't believe I did that, that you realize how hard it was. Mm. And I would add to, actually, yeah, like your talent, I think will get your foot in the door. And then, mm-hmm. and then it's about outworking people. It, it's yeah. about that opportunity is you're so fortunate to get that opportunity. Don't waste it. Like work as hard as you can. Uh, that's something I teach people when I do uh, art. I, I volunteer to teach art to like uh, high schools and elementary schools in Southern California. But um, it's one of the things I try to teach them is that the driven student is better than the talented student. Because if you go back to that artist I was talking about, you know, he plateaued. Well, if you're talented, you're basically most of the time you're just relying just on your talent. 
Yeah. And so your talent will take you so far. The person who has to work hard and the person who studies and practices and the person who yeah. has drive and motivation and doesn't give up, they're going to pass that talented person okay. and eventually. And so you, you, the talent, you know, it's, it's true. It only gets you so far. All right. Well, um, it, thanks. Thanks every, uh, everybody for joining us. Uh, everybody watching at home. Thank you. Hopefully, like I said, we'll see you either in November or in July, 2022, uh, here in San Diego. Um, we had an earlier conversation that I mentioned on Twitch, uh, Lee's Twitch stream. So if you want to see that longer conversation, you can go to twitch.tv slash Art K O H S E A R T. And with that, uh, thank you guys. This has been fantastic the past couple of weeks uh, talking to you guys about this and really appreciate it. Thank um, you, Johnny. I loved it. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah. I thank, thank you right, guys. You and thanks, folks. Week. Thanks, everybody. Take care. I'll Bye. call you, John. Bye, guys. Right. Take care, everybody. Bye, Dan. Bye. Uh -huh. oh, out all right. All right, guys. Awesome. Lee, uh, let me know awesome. if you need my copy of the recording. Okay. And I will send it over. Not a problem. Um, and good seeing everybody. I got my camera.